Welcome into an Oscars edition of the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. What do the Oscars have to do with the NBA? Technically nothing, but Sap and I are both massive, massive movie fans, and uh, it is Oscars weekend. They are happening on Sunday. Pandemic be damned. I think it's all virtual, though. Hopefully it's all virtual. Um, So it got us to thinking... Let's talk about movies for once, but we're not going to completely ignore the NBA and basketball. We're going to talk about the best basketball movies, and it, basketball doesn't always lend itself to the greatest cinema in the world, but there have been some good ones. Sap, I know that you were uh, up for the past couple of nights re-watching everything, really scientifically determining what the best basketball movies were. Yeah, it was a very difficult assignment. It's It's not as easy as if we were going to pick the five best boxing movies, that's a lot easier. Boxing is the sport that lends itself to great movies because boxing is more of a character study anyway. And you can get an actor to look like a boxer and, you know, move like a boxer. I mean, see raging bull, which isn't just the greatest sports movie ever made. It's one of the three or four greatest movies ever made in my opinion. So that's literally a cinematic masterpiece. Even movies like Rocky, Million Dollar Baby, they're fantastic. So that sport really lends itself to great cinema. Whereas it's almost hard to make a bad boxing movie, I feel. Really, it is. Yeah, because it's it's you could pick any fighter. I mean, Jake LaMotta was a really accomplished fighter. He wasn't Sugar Ray Robinson, but he was such an interesting character. And then in the hands of Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, obviously if anyone's seen that movie, it's, it's just, to me, it's the greatest movie of the last 40 years. And a little bit later, we're going to get into like the worst best pictures, yeah. which, you know, sounds like an oxymoron, but there are plenty of those or, or how I would have changed it. You know, there may have been a, a good movie that won best picture snub. Yeah. Like if I was the only person voting, here's what I would have done instead of what Oscar did, but basketball can be difficult because it's tough to make actors look like they're good basketball players. Not a lot of guys, that are going to go out there and look like good basketball players. It's, it, it's difficult. So um, that's why some of the best movies, the actors aren't necessarily um, real actors. They're basketball players playing as actors, but the coach may be it's an actor coach. or something. It's, so coach, it's about yeah. the coach. Most of these movies on my top five list have to do with coaches. Number five for me is white men can't jump. Uh, I thought Woody Harrelson looked like a basketball player. I mean, move like one Wesley Snipes as well. They both, we're good at what they did. And, uh, you know, my favorite player from my youth, Marcus Johnson has a cameo in there as a, as a tough guy. Um, and I, I think it was a good movie. Ron Shelton, who was a basketball player, wrote and directed the movie came out in 1992. So I've got white men can't jump at number five. I like white men can't jump a lot. Sap. Uh, it's a, it's a fun movie. I mean, it's, it's not a lot of like drama in it. They're not really exploring anything that's, that's uh, particularly deep. Uh, but it is entertaining. Two very good actors, and um, uh, I actually think that they have been kicking around the idea of doing a, a sequel years later with them. You know, still trying to like you know hustle people as older basketball players and shoot. So that could be that could be interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I do I do enjoy that movie a lot. You have that in your top five? Um, in my top five. See, I cheated, Sap. And I, I I put more than five on my list, and would I I would have that though around the same as you as five. Okay. I, the only um, thing I ranked was I ranked dead last Uncle Drew. Yes, I well, because see. you you hate. I won't Kyrie see Irving. it, but I know for a fact it's the worst basketball movie ever made. And you're not going to see Space Jam two either because you don't hate LeBron as much as you hate Kyrie, but you're not a big fan of. LeBron, I will see so. that, but not admit to anybody that I saw it. Ah, I see. I see. Because LeBron's going to win an Oscar at some down at some point. No, he will. Uh, not. <laughs> yes, he will. Well, Kobe Bryant won one, so I think LeBron can win one. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see. In fact, Space Man, uh, Space Jam Two comes out the same week as the NBA Finals, so I'm Is pretty that sure number the Lakers one are going to be list? playing. No, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> Space Jam Two already. It's number one. <laughs> It's number one, and I haven't even seen it yet. Uh, number four is Glory Road, which came out in 2006. Yeah, I love that movie. Fantastic movie. It's about uh, Texas Wesleyan, which was the first all-starting black five to win an NCAA championship. They beat an all-starting white five. Or I don't even know if I've got the right order of words I'm using there. Yeah, uh, U- University of Kentucky, Kentucky, which actually had Pat Riley jumping center at six foot four in the 1966 
NCAA championship game, Texas Wesleyan beat Kentucky. They are now uh, UTEP, really, right? They're now UTEP, yeah. Clem Haskins uh, was the coach then and then went to UTEP. And actually, Clem Haskins coached Tim Hardaway Sr., who was a great guard at um, UTEP and a borderline Hall of Famer. So I got Glory Road at number four uh, in my list. That came out in 2006. I think that's just a really, really solid basketball belief. Yeah, it's a great story. It's a true story. It's kind of like, um, remember the Titans yes. for basketball? It, it did kind of come out under the radar. Everybody talks about remember the Titans still, and Glory Road sort of under the radar, but really, really good. Uh, and a, a true story with guys that you recognize throughout it who ended up playing in the NBA. Pat Riley, JoJo White's in that movie. Not the actual JoJo White, but the the mm-hmm. uh, character that he, uh, you know, he was when he was at Kansas? Is that where JoJo White played basketball? Kansas State. Kansas State. I was yep. close. Uh, although people who went to Kansas State wouldn't like that I said, called them Kansas. Oh. Um, so, uh, yeah, really good movie, Sap. That's a good pick. Yeah, I re- really enjoyed that. And again, it, it kind of surprised me when I went to see it. That was at a point where I saw every movie. I, I've been uh, in a movie slump the last couple of years. I have glaucoma. I have cataracts that I want to have taken care of. You have start excuses. Going back to juice. And I have excuses as well. So <laughs> I, I have not been the movie buff I normally was. Uh, but when Glory Road, Road came out, I was like seeing like three movies a week. So it really surprised me. Number three for me is I kind of surprised my own self by putting it on there. But the more I thought about it, this had so much star power in it that I, I put it at number three, Blue Chips, which came out in 1994. Shaq. Shaq's in it. Penny Hardaway's in it. Marcus Johnson, again, playing an assistant coach. Um, Nick Nolte? Uh, Nick Nolte was really good in that place, <laughs> kind of like a Bobby Knight character. Yeah. Like this loud, obnoxious coach. There's He's crazy. savings going yeah, on. Perfect yeah, Nick Nolte him. is perfect for that. Nick Nolte in real life is, is insane, but a very good actor. So I got Blue Chips at number three. That came out in 1994. Um, pretty authentic with the basketball, you know, choreography. Scummery. Scum- yes. <laughs> yes, really much so. But that's what makes that such tough, 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 tough for me. So tough for basketball is like, do these guys look like basketball players? That happens a lot in baseball movies where the guy, you know, like the natural is really good because Robert Redford was a really good baseball player. So you could see him throwing the ball like a baseball player, you know, um, ba- um, Kevin Costner uh, uh, in any of his uh, baseball Bull movies. Bull Durham, Field of Dreams. You could see he's an athlete. Then sometimes you see it and the person's not throwing like a real athlete and it kind of ruins it. But uh, Blue Chips, it, it, when I was making this list, I'm like, the more I think of it, I really enjoy that movie. And again, anytime you see Shaq on the big screen. I haven't seen that you know, since he, I was a kid, but I should rewatch yeah, Blue Chips. Yeah, it was, it was good. And Shaq does fill up the big screen uh, pretty much unlike anyone else. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm curious. So that was three. I'm curious what your top two are, because obviously you're going to have left off some, cause I made a list of like eight. Okay. Yeah. You time. always, when we do list, you always do more. Than I cheat. I do. Yeah. I did cheat. Yeah. I went with number two hoop dreams, which also came out in 1994. Now that's a documentary. Yeah. That's about, cheating. Nope. I could have put documentaries on sap. I well, can't consider that cheating. Roger Ebert said it was the best film of 1994. So <laughs> if it was good enough for Roger Ebert. It's good enough for me. <laughs> um it's since he never played basketball long. what's he know no not at all um let's see who were the the two players that you know went on to play college basketball but really you know not of any note in the nba um william gates and arthur ag were the two young players and they followed them from like ninth grade on um it was it, it was really well done and again um i put that at number two and number one I'm not the person that normally goes along with everyone else. I, I tend to like to be a little bit different. I have Hoosiers at number one. I know it's sappy and all that stuff, but it's just a fascinating story. And Gene Hackman is so good in that. He just nailed it. I mean, every time I see it, I think of Gene Hackman really is Eddie Sutton, who coached at Kentucky and Arkansas and Oklahoma State, and who's going to go into the Hall of Fame posthumously um, in, I believe, the class of, 2021 um it's just a great movie old hickory you know i I, apparently i was looking for uh, brad stevens and uh, gordon hayward in it and couldn't find them yep but they were there got a little closer well when they when that movie came out came out in 1986 like the next spring the hoosiers won the national championship and you know it had all of that feel to it and as you've said 
Indiana basketball now feels kind of like Nebraska football. Like it's kind of like far behind the times, but I still have it as number one. I think a lot of people have that in number one sap because uh, it's just there's really no flaws in it as a sports movie. Uh, yep. You know, the acting is good. The story is is, is interesting. Um, and uh, it's just like a feel good movie. People are happy to watch it. Doesn't yeah. make you feel like the press. So, yeah, I think a lot of people consider that uh, as if not the greatest, certainly one of the greatest basketball movies, um, a movie to me that I don't know if this stands out to me because it was the first R rated movie I ever saw in theaters, but he got game. uh, Oh yeah. Denzel Washington and Ray Allen and Walter McCarty um, was also in that movie. That's Uh, why you like it. Yeah. Uh, Though Walter McCarty is in some trouble. So maybe I should stick away from liking Walter McCarty. Um, I I just, Denzel Washington's great in everything. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. that that goes without saying Spike Lee directed this, uh, the soundtrack is done all by public enemy. Uh, it was, so the experience of going to see an R rated movie for the first time in theaters with my dad was really cool. I remember going to, we went up to ticket counter and the, the ticket taker said, you know, there's a graphic sex scene in this. And my dad's like, so he basically told the ticket counter, mind your own business. Um, Good for him. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I've so, never understood that yet. Like if there was violence, no one would say a, a thing, <laughs> but if there's sex involved, it's like, we can't let the children see sex. What's more natural sex or violence. <laughs> right. Only well, in America. Some people would say both. Uh, right. um, but it was, uh, it was, uh, I, so the experience maybe heightened the movie a little bit more for me, but I, it is a good movie about a, a dad who was in, basically been incarcerated for his whole son's life as the son becomes an elite basketball prospect. And the dad is trying to steer him in one direction to go to a certain school. And the son has his own opinions. The son is played pretty well by Ray Allen, who showed yep. some acting chops as a, as a young NBA player. I mean, he was probably a year in the league, maybe. Yeah, what year did that come out? Was that in the, that was in the late like, 90s? Yeah, 99. Yeah, maybe. he'd been drafted in 96, so he's probably 25 years old at that time because that movie's over 98, 20 Seth. years old. 98, so he was in his second or third year, which is interesting that they picked him. I think basketball players, of all the athletes, could pull it off as an actor because they have that natural charisma screen presence. Like, I could see Russell Westbrook being a pretty good actor. First of all, he's a very good-looking guy. You know, he, he carries himself that way, more so than other sports. Uh, you know, like maybe quarterbacks in football could – turn around and be good at you know good actors i mean oj simpson was not a really good actor he was okay uh running back jim brown was actually a pretty good actor after being you know for the longest time in my opinion the greatest football player ever but yeah the basketball guys can pull this off because they just have that natural charisma presence you know um and ray allen was sensational in that yeah that that's a sensational movie uh, so there's just an interesting note about the, the casting of, uh, of that movie, Sap. This is from the Wikipedia page. Uh, for the role of Jesus Shuttlesworth, Ray Allen's character, which is an awesome name. Uh, it is. Spike Lee had drawn up a list of every NBA player who could pass for a high schooler, uh, for a high school senior. Kobe Bryant was the original choice to portray Jesus Shuttlesworth. But after shooting several air balls that resulted in a brutal playoff loss to the Utah Jazz in the 97 playoffs, he planned an extensive workout plan that would help maintain his strength throughout the duration of longer NBA seasons. So Kobe wouldn't do it because he wanted to work on his actual basketball game. Tracy McGrady was found to be too reserved by Spike Lee. He mm-hmm. was not impressed by Allen Iverson's performance uh, behind the camera. Management for Kevin Garnett and Stephon Marbury wanted a guarantee that one or the other would be offered the part. Travis Best, Walter McCarty, and Rick Fox also auditioned, and Spike Lee cast them in supporting roles. Uh, Spike Lee then approached Ray Allen during halftime of a Bucks Knicks game, ultimately offering him the role of Jesus Shuttlesworth. Ray Allen had never acted before, and he trained with an acting coach for eight weeks prior to filming. Hmm. And so we could have had uh, I could have had Kobe Bryant or Kevin Garnett or Allen Iverson starring in this movie, but we got Ray Allen. Yeah, I think Ray Allen. And in terms of casting, you can buy Ray Allen being Denzel Washington's son. Yeah, I, I, you can you can buy that. I think that um, also because Denzel Washington is such a good actor, you might be able to buy really that is. on his son, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> or you're yeah. his son. No, it's, it's it's the other way around. It's kind of like Daniel Day Lewis could morph into someone. Right, uh, yeah. Denzel's pretty much the same thing. So yeah, no, I I love whatever that film. he tells me. I believe it. That's... Yeah, just as as they said, give him a script, he'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's just the movie that 
Uh, it's a good movie. I don't know upon rewatching it now that I would say it's the best basketball movie, but it, it's certainly worth mentioning uh, in mm-hmm. terms of a, a movie that holds a, a place near and dear to my heart. Another one, Sap, is uh, the original Space Jam, just because I grew up with it. it it's not yeah. by any stretch of the imagination a good movie, but uh, for a young Jet Stryer who grew up idolizing Michael Jordan in basketball and like Bugs Bunny, it was a lot of fun to, to watch that movie. Space Jam 2 will be better, without question, with LeBron James involved. The bar is low in terms of quality of movie, uh, but in terms of nostalgia, the bar is high, if that yes. makes any sense. It does make total sense. Uh, Trainwreck did not make my list. Um, it's got not a, a basketball very... movie, though. It's just a short scene of basketball. Yeah, it's a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Amari Stoudemire is actually good in that. Good for good for Amari Stoudemire. Who is in Space Jam Two from the NBA? That I'm 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 trying to remember who the hell LeBron cast in this movie. That's going to be an NBA player. I think AD is in it, right? I believe I so. Was, yeah, I, I, I think that was part of the deal. Really done much right? research. Yep, you come to LA, we'll put you in a movie. I mean, I'm is Richard Jefferson in it or Shane uh, Battier guys? There, I'll like tell you, LeBron guys. I'll tell you who he got from the NBA right now. Um, he got uh, Clay Thompson, Anthony Davis, Ooh. Damian Lillard, Ooh. unfortunately Kyrie Irving, uh, Chris Paul, Draymond Green, and man, is this ever a bone to be thrown? Kyle Kuzma. <laughs> yeah, that's something worth there. Yeah, Kyle uh, <laughs> maybe begged for the part. He's just trying to maybe <laughs> propping him up. I think LeBron's just recruiting at this point, right? Maybe he wants Dame Lillard to play with the Lakers at some point. Or back to your theory – that LeBron's going to buy the Portland Trailblazers when he retires. But by then, yes. Dame Lillard might be retired as well. But, um, yeah, it's going to be, be interesting to see. Also, a couple WNBA players, uh, Diana Taurasi, uh, namely mm-hmm. among them. Uh, Maybe so the greatest we'll player ever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people consider her to be the greatest I, I'm uh, a big fan of Maya Moore. Ever. I think Maya Moore is my favorite women's player ever. I just did okay. something about her, especially her. Lisa Leslie, Cheryl Swoops. They're all fantastic. Yeah, Tamika Catchings, uh, who's father Cheryl Miller. Harvey Catchings played. Cheryl Miller's the – you make a case, Cheryl Miller's the Michael Jordan, right? She was, like, so big a star. Um, the funny story is her and Reggie would go play, like, two dudes, two on two, and she'd dominate because she was a little older than Reggie Miller. And you know, He said he Reggie always Mi- said she was better than him. Oh, yeah, Reggie Miller came home one – game you know high school games going i scored 37 tonight and she's like yeah i scored 100 in the first half <laughs> it's like how do you top that she's also great she hasn't been on tv as much as she used to no be. i like her smart. i'm not sure why because she's great as a sideline reporter and she's awesome I, I always enjoy her and plus yep i mean the amount of respect people have for her. that's the the just to go off a quick WNBA tangent here that's the thing that a lot of fans don't understand is how much the nba players respect and enjoy yes. the WNBA product. It's not like the typical guy, oh, this is boring, it's just laps. The no. NBA players love it, and they know, because they, they've scrimmaged against these women. They, they're they legit. They're, 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 oh, yeah. They don't, the NBA players don't think anything but extremely highly of every single person who's in the WNBA. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I remember doing games many years ago. This is obviously at the lowest level, but – I would rather – I did play-by-play play for both boys and girls high school basketball games, and I enjoyed the girls' games better because I, I thought the product was um, more the way that we could understand the game because they – you know, like even in high school, you've got these freakish athletes that you're like, I can't do that. Whereas the girls, it was different. There was more passing, more shooting. That's why Steph Curry's the most popular player among women because they, they look at Steph and Can say – Can emulate well, it more. Emulate it more like – LeBron, you, there, there aren't guys, let alone women, that can do that type of stuff. So that's why they love Steph. And another play, they love Kobe. And Dwayne Wade's wildly popular, too, among women, uh, the women players. Um, so, yeah, uh, Cheryl Miller is basically the Michael Jordan of, of the women's game. So I, I didn't mean to leave her off. I just – what Maya Moore did the last couple of years in giving up her career for social oh, justice. How can you just – how can you dislike her? Yeah. I mean, she's she's like, you know – she should be a candidate for time person of the year, in my opinion, that, that certainly supersedes that. It's probably the closest thing to Colin Kaepernick in sports. And, and, and that, and then she actually did more. She actually something. saved a life. Yeah. I mean, I mean, as much Kaepernick's accomplished a lot, but he's kind of gone silent and I'm still, it's abstract his message though, right? Isn't there. It's it a is, conversation. Absolutely. Right. Whereas hers is more concrete. 
Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, we got off on a little bit of a WNBA tangent, but that's okay. I do. I really, I do appreciate the WNBA. And I, yeah. I think LeBron was wise to put WNBA players in this movie coming up because yep. uh, it, well, you know, it, it gives him some PR points. Also, uh, it's more inclusive that way. And why not? Yep. There's lots of women who love playing basketball, love basketball. Um, so, Sap, now that we've gotten the basketball movies out of the way, because as I mentioned, it doesn't really lend to great movies. I mean, none of those movies that we mentioned were even in the best picture stratosphere. No. Uh, best and worst best picture since you said. 1980. So you said a, a very. This is going back before I was born. Now I've seen a lot of these movies, so that's okay. well. You tweeted this out, right? You tweeted this, or you retweeted this. This but the poster thing I that came out, out with the last 80 was you could only keep three. You could only keep yeah, three I, of you know those. What? I remember we talked about that, and I had a I had to amend one of them. Uh, I forgot. Platoon should be in there. Platoon was one I would have kept. So, so let's do this, been... Sap. What do you look at? Is you can, you don't have to keep three. Let, I'll, I'll, no, I'll allow it. You can what we're going to do? Let me do. Let me do this. This is. I'm going to give you. Um, seven or eight movies that I don't think deserve Best Picture, and I give you the movie that I think should have won Best Picture, and just react to this and see see sure. if you believe this. Um, 1980, Ordinary People was Best Picture. Very fine right. film. Raging Bull did not win Best Picture. Raging Bull, to me, is the best movie since 1980, and it's one of a handful of the greatest movies ever made. 1982, Snub. Gandhi. Gandhi won. Um, again, Oscar loves these giant biopics like how do oh, you yeah. not give best picture to gandhi but et tootsie and the verdict are all better movies uh, in fact i got a column out on full press coverage you know detailing all of this and saying sports debates are one thing like okay we're going to d- debate rogers brady whatever the case is movies are tough because how do you compare gandhi to tootsie i mean they're completely different movies but i think tootsie, similar message ET, in the verdict, yeah, very similar message. To uh, so I think ET, um, do you know, Sam, and the verdict were all better. ET made me scared of movies for about twenty years. My parents wow. had me watch it at two years old. That's too young to watch ET. I was Way petrified of. E- I was petrified of ET, and at Universal Studios because we used to go when I was younger. Yep. They had an ET ride. I would just about piss my pants every time we were talking about going on the ET ride. Yeah, that's kind of young to see ET. I, I, I love your parents' e. approach, though. I love your parents' approach of getting you exposed to these things at a young age. I remember. I'm still honestly kind of scared of it. Well, it is it is an interesting looking creature, um, but I he think scared it's a the, the movie. crap out of me. Yeah, yeah, not not the best looking creature, not not cute. Uh, and then when he, he got sick and he turned light. gray, he looked like dry yeah, dog was, poop. It scared me. Yeah, yeah, it did, and. You know, he drank Coors Light like I did in the 80s. So I, I did, and you know, kind of have that connection. species like you did in the yes. 80s. <laughs> yep, absolutely. He was not a healthy, you know, creature. Uh, 1989, this is one of the worst best pictures. Driving Miss Daisy, Bruce Beresford, who was the director, didn't even get nominated for best director. So how can the it's director not be unusual. nominated? And then the picture wins picture. Like there's always one or two directors of a best picture nominee that doesn't get nominated, but not when the picture wins right, best wins. picture is the director right. nominated. That happened years later in um, Argo. Argo won best picture and um, um, Ben Affleck wasn't nominated. Ben Affleck wasn't nominated which for bogus. best, which is crazy. And and Argo shouldn't have won best picture either in 2012. It should have been Lincoln, but that's another story. Um, but l- listen to this group in 1989, Driving Miss Daisy won best picture. My Left Foot with Daniel Day Lewis was much better. Born on the 4th of July with Tom Cruise, directed by Oliver Stone, much better. And Do the Right Thing, which didn't even get nominated for Best Picture, much better. Those three That's films ridiculous. much better, Driving Miss Daisy. Yeah, they really got it bad. Uh, let's go to 1990, Dances with Wolves over Goodfellas. You've got to be kidding me. Uh, 19... yeah, Goodfellas is a top five movie for me. Right. I mean, it's not quite up there for me, but it's it's close. Uh, 1996, like Elaine Bennis, I'm not a big fan of The English Patient. Uh, mm-hmm. and Fargo should have won Best Picture. I know you're not a yeah, big Coen Brothers fan, no. but I love Fargo. Uh, 1998, Shakespeare in Love over Ooh, that's a tough Private one. Ryan. That's Saving a tough Private one. Ryan. But here's probably, well, this is probably the second worst. 2002, Chicago over... I like Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like it. About Schmidt with Jack Nicholson and Far From Heaven with Julianne Moore were both better. Uh, to me, this is the worst. Just hate musicals. It's not nice. I don't. Seth. I don't. I do not want to have any fun at the movies. Uh, <laughs> Crash 
won Best Picture in 2005. Oh, yeah, no one, no one likes that movie. <laughs> worst Best Picture ever. I still think it was a mistake. Munich by Steven Spielberg was far better, as was Brokeback Mountain. Um, and in 2012, Argo won, should have been Lincoln. 2006 was tough because I was so happy that The Departed and Martin Scorsese won. Mm. Because he deserved God, I love you know, multiple party. Oscars before, but you like The Departed more than I do. I actually yeah. liked The Lives of Others, which was a German film better than The Departed, and I thought the best movie of that year was Pan's Labyrinth. Um, oh God, Pan's Labyrinth's awesome. I, you, you can't, another I, great movie. I won't yeah. argue. I won't argue there. Yeah, I, I love that, those. Are all great movies, but but you know what? I, I we're both like you know president and vice president of the Scorsese fan club, so him finally winning best director and best picture was you know long overdue he should have won it for raging bull should have won it for goodfellas heck he could have won it for taxi driver and years um, later del toro got it anyways so for the shape of water which was a brilliant yep. film i love that the only thing i thought that year that um uh there was a film that i thought was better which now the name escapes me that's how much i thought it was better um <laughs> it was um i forget if the name could, of it it's, if you could tell me who's in it maybe i could help you out but timothy chalamet um oh, oh yeah uh, call me by your call name. me by your name yep that's it i thought that was a better film but i have no problem with the shape of water i thought that was you know I, that's why i didn't put it on the list because it's it's just a, a slight oversight but crash driving this uh, daisy the year see the year crash one i just don't think was a particularly good year listen no, crash it? didn't deserve no. it i i just rewatched munich recently yeah it's not that good it's certainly oh, not I, love it. I don't think it's oh, in spielberg's really? top 10 no, but that's how talented yeah, he is. I know he maybe is, it's not I, in there. I didn't love it as uh, upon okay. rewatching it as much as yeah, I, I thought. thought it was, was so the other well one, Sap? Uh, Brokeback Mountain, which I've never by seen that. Name. Okay, Brokeback fairness. Mountain's excellent. Um, similar theme, somewhat. Obviously, uh, Call Me by Your Name is better, but Brokeback Mountain. But you're right; that was a weak year. Certainly of those year. three, probably the one that with the most staying power is Brokeback Mountain, the most cultural yes. imprint, right? Oh, absolutely. And and also that year, Match Point, Woody Allen's movie was sensational yeah. as well. That could have won Best Johansson Picture. in that one? Yes. yes. How can a movie be bad if my dear yes. Scarlett Johansson's <laughs> in it? Can't possibly be bad. That's true. Uh, any other yep. snubs, Sap? No, that's about it. That's about it. Uh, I have some similar ones to you in 1980. Obviously, Raging Bull should have won. Uh, hard to hard to argue that. I, I don't know what they were thinking, but it seemed to be a, a trend uh with with <laughs> with scorsese movies where they're just like yeah he's not eh, that maybe good. next Let's year give it to him um i i'm i see i just wrote down the years you'll tell me who won sap um in 1981 i thought it should have been raiders of the lost ark you know how i feel about uh those types of movies in indiana jones and stuff like that uh, yeah so i would I, agree with you on that over re- uh, over um chariots, chariots of fire, fire. Which is a fine yep. movie. I, I do. I actually enjoy Chariots of Fire, but uh, I, I, Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of my f- absolute favorite movies of all time. Um, uh, in nineteen, then I went to nineteen ninety. Sap. I jumped ahead. Uh, I agree. Goodfellas, obviously, uh, Dances with Wolves is a long, boring movie. Uh, Godfellas Part Three got nominated for Best Picture for a movie that's so yeah. derided. I still think Godfather Part 3 on its own isn't bad. It's just not as good as 2 or the original. Um, Then, uh, yeah, Saving Private Ryan Sap is, to me, one of the greatest snubs of all time. Uh, I believe it is the greatest war movie of all time. It's up there. It's up there. I still think Platoon is my favorite, but that's a close second. It is also the the single most uh, engaging first scene in a movie i think that there's ever been in terms of like dragging you into the movie and saying okay this movie could be 10 hours long i'm watching the entire movie i mean that is Spielberg's pretty good at his craft isn't he that is as intense of a first scene as you could possibly imagine it's like hitting you with a sledgehammer right out of the gate credits roll you're in normandy um (laughs) what other other snubs did i have sap um in 2007, No Country for Old Men won. You know how I feel about the Coen brothers. I thought Their Will Be Blood was a better movie, uh, which I you do might too. agree with because you don't really like Daniel Day-Lewis. As much Lewis. an oversight as you. Actually, you know what I thought the best movie of 2007 was? And this Juno. is going to surprise you because it's it's not a serious, heavy movie, which I normally like. I thought Juno was the best movie yeah. of 2007. It's a good movie. Yeah. 
Uh, it turns, you know, how I look at this a lot, Sap, is what's the cultural imprint? Like, does, does it have cultural significance years later? Do people still talk about it? And a, a lot of these, I think, like, just kind of go by the wayside after, you know, the initial run of, oh, one best picture, I'm going to catch up and watch it. Like, no one talks about Crash anymore. Or oh, a lot of these movies. I don't think anybody really talks about No Country for Old Men much anymore. No, and, and again, that was probably a Lifetime Achievement Award for the Coen Brothers. And I'm a we huge Coen Brothers it. fan. I thought Fargo deserved Best Picture, so let's give it to them for No Country for Old Men. I like that movie a lot. I think There Will Be Blood was one of the most intense movies of the last 20 years. But it, God, is in he the so end, good in that movie? Juno. <laughs> Holy crap, was he amazing in that movie, Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> um, another snub I had, Sap, was in 2009. That's the year they expanded it to like a billion movies. I thought the best movie of the year was Up. Uh, it's the first time I thought an animated mm-hmm. movie was the best film of the year. That movie makes yep. me cry every single time I watch it. And it so it elicits an emotional response. Not taking away from The Hurt Locker, which is an excellent movie. I also thought you could have Inglorious Bastards was a better movie than The Hurt Locker that year. Yeah. No, no, you got good points there. Um, uh, what else did I had? Oh, in 2014, so a, a little bit more recent one. Uh, I thought Whiplash was the best movie that year. I think Birdman sucks. Birdman is my least, maybe my least favorite Best Picture winner of all time. I genuinely didn't get it. I know some people swear by it. I, I, I thought it was awful. I, I, it was almost unwatchably bad. Yeah, I think Whiplash was the best movie that year. I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. J.K. Simmons uh, won Best Supporting Actor, should he have did. been nominated, and probably won for Best Actor. Yeah, you could certainly make that case. He was in the movie just as much as uh, as the lead in that. Uh, why I'm forgetting his name, I, I don't I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I really it, it's it's a combination of loving Whiplash and and reviling Birdman, um, mm-hmm. which I just yeah again in your it, is a little bit too experimental for my my liking. I appreciate the altruism, but uh, you know, not for best picture. So those were my snubs. Sap, do you have a list of before we get to your best? We'll end with the best. Do you have a list of your single worst best picture winners? It doesn't have to be ones that were they were better than, but ones that you just genuinely didn't think were. Crash, crash good. is a, kind of in a league of its own. Um, I also think Driving Miss Daisy, Shakespeare in Love that. that I just didn't get it. I, I, those, those are the three. Um, Oliver, I mean, I'm going way back. This is 1968. No, we said um, 1980, Sep. You're, you're cheating again. Yeah, since 1980. But I'm going to go, because <laughs> I'm a huge Stanley Kubrick fan, as you know. And I think you're not quite as big a Kubrick no. fan as I am. I love The Shining. But 2001, A Space it. Odyssey, which I think is one of the five or six greatest movies ever made, didn't even get nominated for Best Picture. He did get nominated for Best Director, but Oliver won. I mean, it, uh, when you look back, Oliver, which is kind of this musical. Yeah, I'm of seeing, sensing a trend here. You hate musicals. Pretty much. Yeah. And I did like La La Land. I did. I thought that was really good. Uh, I did enjoy that. Fine. Moonlight won. Uh, yeah. After I La La love Land Moonlight. 30 seconds. <laughs> yes. Shortest rain yeah. ever. I didn't get Moonlight. I didn't. It wasn't for me. My wife, that's like her favorite best picture of the past, like, 10 years she loves that yeah i thought that was i thought that was a good movie i don't think it was oscar worthy but it was good um i had for my worst one sap i just told you birdman didn't like yeah. it at all didn't like i wasn't even everybody has, that at all everybody has crash everybody has crash uh crash is like you know you look at it and go how the hell did that happen i think with shakespeare and love sap see i think it's a good movie i enjoy it i think it's more reviled because of the things it got, it got nominated, it won over Elizabeth and Saving Private Ryan, which are both clearly better movies. So I think that Shakespeare in Love kind of gets a bad rap because it was unfairly won over two movies that are superior to it. But in its own, I wouldn't say it's a bad movie. I think right. it's good. But and that can uh, be the case. Um, yeah, uh, American Beauty also I didn't love. Yeah, yeah, I, I can go along with that. I mean, Saving Private Ryan, Spielberg won Best Director. But it didn't yeah. win Best Picture. So, and that happens. You know, every few years you'll see that difference. There's a theory but, that that Saving Private Ryan and Elizabeth, like, split the vote. And somehow, somehow Shakespeare and Love came out on top in that scenario. Yep. Um, best best Picture, Sap, to wrap it up, what are the very best that you have? Since 1980, we're not going back to Wings. Oh, since 1980? Um, Give me Schindler's your list. top five. Schindler's List, Million Dollar Baby. 
Um, those would be the two best. Uh, let's see. What else would I put up God, there? I never want to watch Schindler's List ever again. I, once is enough Platoon, for me. Platoon would also be up there. I would say in the Silence of the Lambs. Platoon, the I Silence of the Lambs. I wouldn't have guessed four. you were a big fan of Silence of the Lambs, Sap, because oh, uh, yeah, you're not a, a big horror. I, I guess it's not really a horror movie. It's a little bit of... No, but it's not. Yeah, it's it's more in your mind. And look, it's Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster. I mean, Yeah, Anthony Hopkins is in that, that movie for like 15 minutes. He won Best Actor. Yeah, yeah. He was sensational in it. I don't even know like if he's Brando in it for and the Godfather. Minutes. Brando won Best Actor in The Godfather, but Al Pacino was in it more in, in the original, and Pacino got nominated for Best Supporting Actor. That That happens. Yeah, uh, for me, I, you know, I again cheated, uh, but I had those same movies there. A Silence of the Lambs I had on there. Uh, Return of the King, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. So that you have to like the genre. Uh, yeah. But I love all those movies. So for me, that I had to put that up there. Argo and Spotlight, I more recent ones that I loved both of those movies. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, Unforgiven. I love Westerns. So I had That's Unforgiven on there. Yeah. Um, also a w- underrated movie that it's not to this level but I, it's insanely rewatchable is the king's speech really really good yeah, movie. i thought it was very good very well acted i thought that black swan was better that year yeah and that's I another movie i just movie, didn't get <laughs> yeah no I, I thought black swan was so intense i also thought that um the social network should have been best film that probably has the biggest cultural imprint yeah. of all if we're talking about yeah. that. That's an important that's a movie people will probably be watching in fifty years and saying, What yep. the hell how do we allow this how do we allow this person who has no social skills to run the biggest social network in the world? Uh <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting exercise, Sap. And we wanted to do this because it was uh, it is in fact Oscar weekend and uh I don't know. Have you seen any of the nominees uh for this one? No, month, I told Sapp? you I've been in a movie slump. I gotta yeah, I gotta I, Get my eyes fixed, and then I'll start catching up. I've seen everything but um, The Father, which I have no interest in watching because it sounds incredibly depressing about, you know, a dad losing his mind to uh, his memory to um, Alzheimer's. Yeah. I don't want to subject myself to that. I just don't feel like crying. Um, but I have seen Trial Chicago 7, 7, Sound of Metal, Promising Young Woman, Nomadland, Minari, <laughs> Mank, Judas, and the Black Messiah. Uh, my guess is Nomadland wins. That seems to be the uh, hmm. prevailing theory. Uh, I thought that the m- movie that, if I'm talking about cultural impact, Promising Young Woman, that's what I would go with. Yeah, it should be interesting to see. So we will see. We'll see how they do this Oscars being virtual, and uh, maybe we'll be uh, adding one of these to either our favorites or least favorites going forward. Sap, we'll see how Oscars play out. And we'll see how the rest of the NBA plays out, and we'll get maybe some man- good basketball movies coming forward with Space Jam 2 and whoever who the hell knows what Hollywood has cooked up for us in terms of basketball. But that's going to do it for us here at the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented as always by our friends at Full Press Coverage. Uh, make sure you check out this podcast and other ones at their website, fullpresscoverage.com. Check out us on iTunes, leave a review. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Jet Stryer. That's my Twitter also is at Jet Stryer. Saps is at John Sap 25, J-O-H-N-S-A-P 25. We tweet out the links to the podcast, so make sure you see it there. Everybody, enjoy basketball. Enjoy Oscar weekend. We will be back on Monday with a fresh podcast. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you then. Sap, enjoy the Oscars. You too. All right, see you, everybody.